Yasas, salvete, and welcome to lesson nine in my medical Greek and Latin series of lessons. Uh, today we'll be talking about prefixes and suffixes. And once again, because this turned into a much bigger lesson than I had expected or planned, I'm going to leave out the root vocabulary and I'll put that into the next lesson. And after that, we'll switch over to a more Latin focused lesson as most of them thus far have focused on Greek. Okay, let's get started. So we'll start with eso. Eso means within, inner, or inward. This is something you've probably heard of before. Um, we have esogastritis, esophagus, that seems to be one that many people already know, esophilaxis, esotropia, esophoria. You'll see the reason for the rectangles on the screen in a moment. Uh, here's what they look like in Greek, isogastritida, that's a mouthful, and uh, this is one of those old third declension ones, um, esophagos, esophilaxia, Interestingly here, we have esotropia and esophoria. And I'm sure you've noticed that the Omicron Yota in Greek um, with an Omicron again at the end there right here is countered by an epsilon here, a short vowel with a long omega. Now, I'm not going to get into all of this because uh, it gets a little complicated with long vowels and short vowels and things like that. But for now, just know that if you are learning the Greek, um, that you will sometimes see uh, multiple spellings. Greek, being such an old language, has had many spelling changes. OK. Um, if we look at the first one here, the isogastritis, this is, you can imagine that was a sigma, and it became a delta. And we've already talked about this when we talked about the name of Greece, Elas, which um, is more commonly called Elada to, today. And Ilias, Iliada, is the Iliad. Okay, so the sigma to delta change is one of the many that happens in Greek. And um, there are... Uh, similar occurrences in other languages. Um, another thing you'll notice here is that the U in esophagus, this is part of this new Latin thing where they took Greek, they changed the spellings, and because we're using the Latin letters, we call it New Latin. So we've got Latin and Greek repackaged. That U.S. is originally just the Greek Omicron Sigma, and this is pretty interesting. We have the word rhinokeros, rhinoceros, and you can see that the O is the surviving representative of the Omicron. However, in hippopotamos, we don't get an O. We don't get hippopotamos. Instead, we get hippopotamus. Why does this happen? Because they're the same thing. Well, at one point, spellings were frozen. They were fossilized, and we left things the way they were. Some still looking like the original Greek, and uh, some changed over. And there are plenty of examples of these here. Um, the god of the sky, Uranos, uh, is not called Uranos when we talk about the planet. It becomes... Uranus, okay, or Uranus, if you prefer that. The O has become a U, and they'll even go so far as to call him a Latin god. Well, a Roman god, that's ridiculous. He definitely is a Greek god. Um, Davros becomes Taurus, okay, like the bull. So don't worry so much about the endings. We're focusing on roots, prefixes some suffixes, and we're taking into account that, yes, sometimes there will be a vowel that's changed or a consonant that's moved or something like that. Okay, let's move on.
This next one uh, does not require any knowledge of science or medicine. Uh, we see it in plenty of our words, but um, if you're not familiar with it, EU just uh, means good or normal, healthy. We have eupepsia, and you might remember Pepsi from an earlier lesson. Uh, eutosia, eucholia, euphoria, and euphemism. How do these look in Greek? Well, we have epepsia. And if you don't remember Pepsi, it means digestion. So dyspepsia is indigestion and eupepsia or epepsia is uh, good digestion. Something goes down smoothly. Of course, we've seen that pep in other things. We've seen it in peptobismol, okay, which we might take when we have an upset stomach. And if, um, if, if this doesn't look familiar, this is our friend Lieutenant Commander Worf eating a cellular peptide cake with mint frosting, as he liked to say. And the cellular peptide cake was um, shown here with Deanna Troy, who's played by actress Marina Sirtis, who is Greek. So there you go. Even Star Trek has some Greek connections. Uh, EU, by the way, uh, is used in other words like in eulogy, the good word. And there's a Latin analog to this, benediction, which is also the good speech. Uh, but this is one of the wonderful things about having Greek and Latin in our uh, linguistic heritage is that we can use EU. And when we run out of things to use it with, we can tap into Latin and bring in the, the Latin analog here, bene. And uh, we have the same thing for the negatives. Uh, the opposite of EU has a Latin analog also, and we'll see that in another lesson later. Another one that you've probably seen before is meta or met. Uh, the met is used when, when the next letter is a vowel or an H. And this means change or after. And this is why uh, the parent company of Facebook is now called meta. This is what they will look like after Facebook uh, when the internet changes and we're all wearing headsets and things like that. And who knows what else they're planning. So. We get words like metabolism, metamorphosis, okay, metencephalon, and um, methemoglobin. Okay, there's that H coming into play, and the E in metencephalon. Now, there is uh, something here I have to get into. This is more of an English thing than anything else. Um, Greek words that end in IS have ES in their plural. And I'm sure you can think of some examples, like we get one crisis, but two crises. One analysis, two analyses. Notice how the spelling and the pronunciation change as well. One metamorphosis, which means one change, two metamorphoses, one parenthesis, two parentheses, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, people take this too far and uh, just the other day on the radio, somebody was giving the plural of process, and they said processes. No, 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 you can't do that. This is not a third declension Greek word. This is not ease. It is processes. So if you hear anybody say processes, you can flag them down and um, send them to me, and I will sort them out for you. All right, next we have the word para, and uh, don't worry about the green word over there to the right yet. The green words rather, para or par. Um, do not confuse this with the Latin par, as in parity. It just means equal. When it's Latin, we're looking at Greek words now. And this means alongside, abnormal, or around, like parametrium, okay, or parahepatitis, paracusia, paronychia. Paramedic, there's a, uh, another word I'm sure we've all seen before, paralegal. 
But these are not to be confused with paratrooper and parachute. Uh, these green things here are a false etymology. In other words, um, this para is not connected to the uh, para that we're learning on this slide. Um, so there are lots of words that begin with par and para, but not all of them. We have to be careful not to uh, create false etymologies, false explanations for where the words come from. Going back to paramedic, a paramedic is someone who works alongside medical professionals. A paralegal is somebody who works around or alongside legal profession professionals, lawyers, right? Um, I'm not giving the Greek in Greek letters here for uh, many of these, nor am I giving the meanings. I'm hoping that you will pause and look these up, or once you've taken very good notes, you'll be able to figure out what these mean. They're all real words, I promise. I'm not making them up. Okay. Next we have pro. And pro means before. This is an easy one to confuse with other ones like pre. We have prodromal, okay, prognathis, prognosis. That's one I'm sure many of you have heard before. Prophylaxis, prophylactic, which is related to the one above it. And if you don't know what a prophylactic is, you might remember the story of the Trojan horse. The Greeks had to create it because they could not penetrate the walls of the city of Troy. And on that very delicate train of thought, I will just leave you with this for your own research uh, to help you learn the word prophylactic. Moving right along. The next few words I want to show you are ones that are not very common, uh, at least not in medicine, although we do see them uh, in science and even in non-scientific terms. Uh, we have amphi and ampho, which just means on both sides, around or both. An amphibian lives in water and on land. Amphitheater, amphitonia, and then we have the word ana, which means up or back again, like anatomy, anagenesis, which is a very fancy way of saying the Renaissance. Renaissance is the rebirth. Anagenesis is the birth again, the rebirth. And in Greek, anagenesi is how you refer to the Renaissance. And kata and cat mean downward or disordered. It's where we get the word catabolism, cathode, catastrophe, which is a downward turn, uh, a turn for the crappy, right? Things go bad. It's a catastrophe. Strophe means turn. Catalyst. And I'm guessing many of you have seen cathode before. Uh, by the way, kata and cat. The cat is used before a vowel or an H. And uh, if you don't know what this is, you're very lucky. This is a catalytic converter. And if your mechanic tells you that you need a new one, that is catastrophic news because they are super expensive. You've probably also heard of cathodes and anodes. The an, remember we said an means going up. Ode is the road or the way. So the anodes are the parts that are trying to get up to the top of the battery. And the cathodes are the parts that are moving down. Cathodos. Okay. Lots of words with odes. So anode and cathode, maybe you've seen those before. Next on the list of not commonly used prefixes are these here, and uh, the first, the first two that you see, or the first two lines, can be confusing. Di and dis are twice or double. If you know the Greek word for two, you know theo. So there's your v. This uh, in Greek means twice, and we get words like diphonia. And uh, one that maybe you haven't heard before, dysdiaclast. 
Dia and die mean through, across, or part, like a diagnosis. You can look this one up and uh, check it against prognosis. Uh, diarrhea, rhea means flowing. So diarrhea means the flowing through. That's a wonderful thought. Of course, we get diameter in mathematics, in uh, geometry, rather. And dioptometer, uh, that's another one maybe you haven't heard of before. For pros and prost, we get the, the meaning in place of. So you might have a prosthesis or prosthodontics. Now, the H that you see there again tells us that it's going to be followed by a vowel or uh, that T will be followed by an H. A uh, dioptometer is this thing right here. I believe it's used to measure the arc of an eyeball, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't happen to have one of these. I think it looks like a lightsaber. And prosthodontics is um, a discipline in dentistry in which we deal with the replacement of teeth, the placing of teeth. Okay, let's move on. All right, even though we're very, very deep into this, I do want to introduce uh, many suffixes here to get them out of the way so we can get to what I think is some of the fun stuff, the vocabulary, and looking at some of the big, meaty words. We have this prefix here. This is a Latin prefix, a uh, suffix rather. Al means pertaining to or located in, like bronchial, psychological. You can see that we've got some Greek and Latin mixed here. Psycho and logic are Greek, but we we uh, stick a Latin suffix onto them. Hypoglossal, again, just like uh, before, Greek with a Latin ending. Um, parenteral. A parenteral. Uh, this is not related to the word parent. Uh, enteral. Entero is the Greek word for intestine, which I believe we saw in a recent video, in a recent lesson. So anything that's parenteral is anything that's administered uh, not using the intestine or the mouth. Um, it might be something that's done intravenously, for example. Now, unfortunately, this one gets really misused. I heard somebody say the other day, sarcastical, and then about five minutes later, they said tragical. No, uh, just because we do it sometimes in science does not mean we can throw together any Latin and Greek words that we want. Um, we try to stay consistent using Greek with Greek and Latin with Latin uh, when we leave science. But some people will go ahead and do whatever they want. Um, we all probably accept the word magical, although the original true adjective would be magic, both as a noun and as an adjective. But we do have um, historic and historical as another example. Our next one is ACE, and uh, this is used to name enzymes. This is a Greek suffix. We have lactase and maltase, <clears throat> lipase, excuse me, amylase. We can talk about that mil later. That's a very interesting one. And the A at the beginning of amylase just means not. Uh, here's a look at one of them in Greek. There's lipasi, and you can see the Greek in the English, there's as e and there's as e. Okay, lifting it right from the Greek. All right, let's move on. Our next one is Asia and Asis, or Asia and Asis. And this is uh, one of the many that means state or condition. So we get hyperchromatia. Okay, or xerasia or xerasia, I've heard both. Uh, if you don't know xer, it means dry. Xerasia is like this, uh, this, I believe it's like a dryness of the scalp. Uh, phlegmasia, I'm not making this next one up. Vlephorocalysis, okay, uh, if you are a student of Greek, you might have learned that a vlephoron is an eyelid, 
And uh, this is a condition of having a droopy eye, droopy eyelid, or swollen eyelid. Uh, and we see this, in other words, as well. We all probably know of the Disney movie Fantasia. Um, while the movie is great, I do have a problem with the way it's spelled. Fantasy is one of the very, very few Greek words that has come into English without its that, that characteristic PH. I mean, Fantasia should technically be spelled with a PH because it is a Greek word. F would mean it came from Latin. So somebody slipped up along the way. Uh, I'm not too happy about it, but we'll just have to let it go. Okay, uh, here's our next one, Ima and Imat. This is another one that means state or condition. Emphysema is the one many of us have probably already heard of. And erythema, if you have studied your Greek colors, you might know that erythro is red. So erythema is uh, a redness of the skin. <laughs> you know, I almost showed pictures of all these things that I talk about until I saw some of them and they were just creepy. So it's up for you to look them up and uh, find out what they look like and how to cure some of these things. Uh, the T in Emma comes in when we want to make an adjective. Oh, by the way, there's what erythema looks like in Greek. I, I should pop in a Greek one every now and then. You can see your epsilon, your epsilon. There's your Y, which is an epsilon. Okay, so these are almost all of these exist as you, you can almost figure out the Greek spelling of them just by looking at the English. When we want to make adjectives of these, emphysema becomes emphysematous and erythema becomes erythematous. Okay, let's move on. This next one here is esis and esia, used for state, condition, or procedure. That's a little new. So we have amniocen, amniocentesis, diaphoresis, diuresis, anoesia, okay, or anoesia, as some people like to say. Uh, anoesia <laughs> actually just means um, nonsense or senseless speaking or uh, illogical expression, and um, this might be a false etymology, but I would say, and I know a lot of people don't like it when I say this, but uh, anoesia is related to the word annoying, and I'll explain why in another video. If it's not true, then it's a useful false etymology anyway. And uh, those of you who study Greek have probably heard somebody say anoesias, nonsense. Amnesia is another word that we've probably uh, all come across at some point or another. And etic gives us the adjectives of esis. So diaphoresis becomes diaphoretic. Diuresis becomes diuretic. Now this is not diarrhea, this is Diuresis, di means through, which we talked about earlier, and ur is urine. So the urine flowing through, if, you drink, if you're drinking something that's a diuretic, it makes you pee, makes you run to the bathroom often. Genetic, sympathetic, pathetic, magnetic, diabetic. Uh, diabetics have a problem with diuresis, actually. Okay, so this is used to make adjectives of nouns ending in esis, and uh, one of my favorite things to drink, green tea, is a major diuretic. All right, our next one is ix, and this forms nouns to indicate a science or a study of something, and I have to use this slide once again, as I have several times in this video, to make a comment about English and how some of us misuse it. Well, ICS can be found in genetics, pediatrics, orthotics, therapeutics, politics. And I have to point out that even though there's an S here, 
Uh, in English, these are singular when we refer to them as subjects or courses of study or something like that, or disciplines. So we would say physics is a difficult subject and pediatrics is the field I'm interested in. Yes, there are times when we don't use these as academic subjects where they could have uh, some use in the plural, but I do hear these misused a lot and there are plenty of them. Physics, geriatrics, aerobics. Aerobics is intense, not aerobics are intense. Okay, all right, so that takes care of X. And our next one is ism, one that we've probably seen many times. This is for abstract nouns of quality, state, or condition. In Greek, it's ismos. And a very quick note here, you'll notice that in Greek, when you have an a sigma and a mi, an S and an M sound, Greeks cannot make the sm sound. That sigma hardens to a Z and that carries over into English as well. Okay, so we have astigmatism. We don't say astigmatism. Okay, that S becomes a Z. Astigmatism, melanism, phototropism, synergism, which some of you may have heard before, organism, lots and lots of these, syllogism, and this is another one that gets mixed up with non-Greek terms, okay, like multiculturalism, multi is Latin, cultural is Latin, and anti-disestablishmentarianism, Oh, this one's, <laughs> this is proof that people sometimes have too much fun making new words. Okay, that takes care of ism. Next, we have isthmus. This forms abstract nouns of state or condition again, or <laughs> muscular spasm. That's an interesting one. Okay, and there's spasm. There's another word with that z in the place of an s and we get chirismus and laryngismus strabismus which some people may have heard of and uh this one <laughs> i'm definitely not going to tell you what this one means pachycolpismus and if you are the kind of student that just loves to uh get to the bottom of a mystery this would be a good time to pause and go look that one up if you can find it but I definitely can't show you a picture of that. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. This next one is extremely common and I'm sure we've all seen at least one word that has the oid ending. Uh, once in a while you'll see oed, although it's uh, rather uncommon in medicine and id is even less common. And this oid is used for nouns and adjectives, and it means shape or form or resembling. So an adenoid, an arachnoid, something that looks like an arachnid, a cystoid, a splenoid, a nematode, and we get lots of non-medical ones like an asteroid, something that resembles a star, and a trapezoid, something that resembles a Trapez. Well, if you're a Greek student, you already know what a trapezi is. Uh, for everybody else, there's your trapezoid. And a trapez or a trapezi is one of these things. Okay, so a trapezoid means the thing that looks like a table. That's all it means. Okay, and uh, the table makes me think of green tea. Ah, and a nice comfy chair to sit on. Interestingly, although this video has been way too long already, uh, trapez comes into something else. You can see that I'm starting to draw, draw a table, a trapez here, but instead I'm going to draw a couple of people swinging. Not that there are circuses anymore in the United States, but imagine you went to a circus and you saw people swinging back and forth. 
What do we call these people? Trapeze artists. Why are they called trapeze artists? Because when they swing far apart from each other, they make something that looks like a table. There you go. Isn't that perky? Okay, let's move on. Our next suffix is oma, and this is used for nouns, often for tumors or diseases. So we have carcinoma, xanthoma, which is like a yellowing of the skin. Xanthos in Greek means blonde or yellow. And we can make adjectives like we did with emma earlier, carcinomatous and xanthomata is when we want to make a plural of the oma. So one xanthoma is one yellowing of the skin. Two xanthomata or xanthomata are two yellowing of yellowing areas of the skin. Next, we have one that we've heard before, os. This is a Latin suffix for adjectives, and it's also used for chemical substances. It means full of uh, or resembling. So it is similar to oid, which we just talked about a moment ago. You'll see hematose, varicose, fructose, glucose. Okay, so fructose means full of the that sugar that's found in fruit. Okay, glucose, gluc means sweet, so glucose is something that's full of sweetness. Comatose is another one we might have seen before. Coma is a Greek word which means deep sleep. And since we're on the topic of chemical substances, I figured I'd um, mention this now. This is obviously the periodic table of elements. I'm not an expert in chemistry and uh, I only look at this table periodically, so I'm not going to say too much, but um, there are some suffixes that are used for chemical substances. We get eight as in chlorate, ide as in bromide, ite as in nitrite, and own as in testosterone. Um, you'll have to look for other um, words that have these, and there are reasons why and when they are used. Okay, and we're going to make the background black because I'm sure your eyes are killing you by this point. This is a really long slideshow. Next, we have O-U-S, us, a Latin suffix uh, for adjectives, meaning uh, pertaining to or characterized by, like amorphous, uh, atricus, okay, which uh, has to do with a lack of hair, uh, pyogenes, pio is the Greek word for pus, and uh, gen means causing or birth, okay? And adipogenous, which is a word you probably have never seen before. And there are many other OUS words like generous and gracious and spacious, and we could go on and on, but there simply is not that much time. And finally, us, a Latin suffix for nouns, for a condition or a person. So, abracius, hydrocephalus, okay, microphthalmus, tetanus. Uh, there are a lot of these. Um, I don't think they'll be very difficult to identify. And the U.S. ending is normally a, uh, a giveaway that it's Latin. There are some Greek ones, but most of these will come from Latin. Okay, Whew. I hope you've been taking good notes. This one might require a second view just to get all the information in. There was a lot. Hopefully you'll understand why I have omitted uh, Greek spellings and explanations of each of the words I've presented. Some you may be able to figure out because you've learned all the parts. Uh, some will just be some homework for you to go ahead, look them up, find out what they are, and better understand how and why they were named. And that's it for today.
Telos. <lacht>